Okay, if I can have your running a few minutes late, but uh, my name is Roberto Trujillo. I'm head of special collections here at the Stanford Libraries. It's a great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the university librarian, Michael Keller, who actually can't be with us this afternoon. He's, he's traveling, but welcome to Stanford. For those of you who are not from the Stanford campus, uh, welcome to the libraries for all of you. Uh, we have a very special guest this afternoon, and we'll have another person actually introduce him. But I do want to mention very briefly that it's, it's extra special to have Bill McDonough here because his archive is coming to Stanford. Uh, the whole thing, the old thing, the new thing, and, and, uh, and what we're calling what, what, what we're calling the living archive because most of what is recorded now is recorded in Born Digital and that's going to be archived here digitally. Anyway, the person who will be introducing Mr. McDonough is Professor Raymond Levitt, who's uh, a professor in the School of Engineering and in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He serves as coordinator of Stanford's graduate program in sustainable design and construction. He's a senior fellow of the Woods Institute of the Environment. He heads up the Woods Institute Sustainable Built Environment Initiative. He founded and directs Stanford's Global Products Center, which conducts research and outreach aimed at delivering more sustainable global building and infrastructure projects. In 2008, he was appointed a commissioner of California's Public Infrastructure Advisory Commission to develop guidelines and policies for channeling private investment and expertise to California's aging transportation infrastructure. He was elected this past year to chair Stanford's Faculty Senate. So, Professor Lovett. Thank, Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Bill McDonough to all of you. Uh, he's an advisor, designer, thought leader, and author. Um, his vision for a future of abundance for all is helping companies and communities to think really differently. Together, they're changing the world. Trained as an architect, McDonough's interest and influence range widely, working at scales from the molecular to the global. Time magazine recognized Bill, calling him a hero for the planet, stating that his utopianism is grounded in a unified philosophy that, in demonstrable and practical ways, is changing the design of the world. William McDonough and Michael Braungart's first book, Cradle to Cradle, which I suspect many of you have read, was a revelation for many of us. People in all walks of life have literally been changed by these ideas. Translated into 12 languages, Cradle to Cradle is considered a seminal text in the environmental movement worldwide. So we're truly fortunate to have Will McDonough here today to remind us of the powerful possibilities that are within our grasp to affect positive change. Um, Bill has several connections to Stanford. You already heard from Roberto that Bill's Living Archive will be hosted at Stanford. He has also been a consulting professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, helping support our initiatives for more energy sustainable buildings and the Woods Institute's uh, Sustainable Built Environment Initiative. The new book that he has written with Michael Braungart, The Upcycle, Beyond Sustainability, Designing for Abundance, is going to be the theme of what he talks about today. So you say beyond sustainability. At a time when many environmentalists are trying to figure out how to change society's artifacts and behaviors to become a little more sustainable, perhaps only Bill McDonough could propose moving beyond sustainability so meaningfully and so convincingly. He has long, long espoused that being less bad is not nearly as good as being more good. And reminds us we can all work effectively towards the latter. So what's the upcycle? As you'll see, drawing on the lessons gained from 10 years of putting the cradle to cradle concept into practice with businesses, governments, and ordinary people, McDonough and Brungart envision the next step in the solution to our ecological crisis. We should not just use or re reuse resources with more effectiveness. We can actually improve the world as we live, create, and build. For McDonough and Braungart, the questions of resource scarcity and sustainability are simply questions of design. They're practical-minded visionaries. They envision beneficial designs of products, buildings, and business practices, and they show us these ideas being put to use around the world as everyday objects like chairs, cars, carpets, and factories uh, get reimagined 
not just to sustain life on the planet, but to grow it. Bill reminds us we can have a beneficial footprint, abundance for all. Please join me in welcoming master architect and visionary, William McDonough. Thank you so much. It's a real privilege to be here, and thank you for coming. I wanted to give the opening talk of the upcycle here in this library in honor of Stanford and all the things that we get to do together, and Roberto, especially to you for working with me on the archive, and it's a, it's a deep, deep privilege. Ray, it's a great opportunity for me to be connected here with this institution and your programs. Um, Beyond sustainability, we like to joke that if I asked you what your relationship to your spouse was and you said sustainable, <laughs> we might say we're sorry. <laughs> is that maintenance? Is that what it is? So I'd like to talk about going beyond sustainability. And the upcycle was uh, released yesterday. So we have it here today. And in a way, it's an upcycling of Cradle to Cradle. And so I have both books here. And because we're in a library, what does it mean that a book be a physical object? Aren't these just words? Couldn't they be on Kindles? What is this? These are two books. These are book books. This book is a polymer. This is technical nutrition in our language. You can read it in the bathtub. It's designed to become polyester and polyester and polyester. Endless resourcefulness of technical material. Imagine. The upcycle couldn't have been made when we made this book. This book has been printed by the largest printer in the United States and is designed down to the molecule to be safe for biology, technology, biology. This book could become porridge for your grandchildren. Of course, it's only fiber, not much nutrition, <laughs> but it's safe. It's even safe for burning. So if you're compelled, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so technology, biology, what is that? With Cradle to Cradle, we put forward the idea that waste equals food, use current solar income, and respect diversity. And we have five fundamental frame conditions. We design materials to either go back to soil safely or be next to human skin and be safe. Do you realize there isn't a single black t-shirt out there that was ever designed to be next to human skin? Imagine or technical nutrition, a technical metabolism, where materials that are in technology return to technology and never contaminate the biosphere. That's the first condition, so biological and technical nutrition. Second, we have reverse logistics. We know where they go, and we know how to get them back. We design for disassembly. We design products as services, because what you really want is the service. If I sell you a television set, you now own 4,360 chemicals. Is that what you want? Is that what you went out to buy? So perhaps you really want the service of that piece of electronic hybridization. And when you finish with it, you'd like a new one, please, you see? The idea of design for durability, if it's your smartphone, really? I mean, how many of you buy a phone and go, this is fantastic, I'm gonna have this for 25 years, <laughs> see? But wouldn't it be great if you could say, I'm gonna have this and then I'm gonna turn it in and it's not gonna pollute the environment, it's gonna become something new without contaminating the biosphere. And I'll get a new one, etc. It's a new kind of planned obsolescence. So instead of just conspicuous consumption, it's endless resourcefulness. See the difference? It's planned obsolescence. We use it, then we take it apart and reuse it, etc. So some things we design for durability, those might be the things we love. 
Think of a car. There's basically, as far as I'm concerned, three kinds of car. The car you need, it's probably small, gets you around, zip car when you need it, whatever. There's the car you want, which is you know, probably BMW, performance, who knows. And then there's the car you love, and that's the one you keep in the garage and bring out on the weekends. For me, it's a 1958 Mercedes-Benz Roadster. But anyway, the idea that we could have the things we need, to have the things we want, and to have the things we love, why not? Some are durable, some are ephemeral, but we know what's next because we designed what's next into what's now. So these two books represent the bookends of Cradle to Cradle, and they're physical objects that are self-similar to the messages that are inside. So this is not virtual. What we're looking at is the idea that materials themselves can have a kind of virtue. So Cradle to Cradle is the fulcrum and when you think of Archimedes, even a famous newspaper on the East Coast misquoted Archimedes a few months ago and said that he said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the earth. Oops. Those of us who have any engineering training whatsoever realize you can't move anything unless you have a fulcrum. Everybody forgets the fulcrum, the thing that does not move. So what is the thing that does not move? That's what Cradle to Cradle is for. It's a, an anchor, it's bedrock. Lean against it. You can use these principles to help you with innovation and design. It's something to rely upon. But we've discovered something in the last 10 years. And with upcycle, if we upcycle cradle to cradle itself, we would even upcycle our language slightly. So our goal with the upcycle is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, soil, water, and power economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. And we're not saying less unjust, less unsafe, less unhealthy. This is a positive direction. And as such, as we looked at the ideas of waste equals food, use current solar income, and respect diversity, we discovered something in the last 10 years. The first was, we no longer use the word waste at all, because in the Hanover Principles 1992, we wrote, eliminate the concept of waste. So we just stopped using the word waste. Because sort of like if I said pink elephant, don't think of a pink elephant. You can't help it. So if we say waste, you can't help it. So forget it. Whenever you say waste, stop yourself, like Dr. Strangelove. And you go, waste, oh, stop. Just say nutrient and watch what happens. So instead of saying waste equals food, we now say everything is food. Food for biology, food for technology, and food for thought. Secondly, instead of just saying use current solar income, we say use clean renewable energy because we're seeing some new techniques for energy generation that I think will surprise all of us. And they don't come from 93 million miles away. Hmm. And then last, we change respect diversity to celebrate diversity. Because you can respect diversity while it dies. I don't know how many of you saw the story of the monarch butterfly a couple weeks ago. The habitat has gone from 20 plus acres 20 years ago to 12 acres last year to 2.9 acres this year in Mexico, their winter valley habitat. From 20 plus acres to 2.9. A lot of reasons, one of which was the drought, another is they're still foresting. People are dragging trees out of there on lumber trucks covered with butterflies. What kind of species are we? And yet there are 900,000 kids in America using us, their smartphones to track the northern migrations of monarchs. And they won't be there anymore. So we can respect the monarchs and their diversity while they disappear. So we decided to say celebrate diversity. So I'm designing a building in Barcelona where the lobby decor instead of trees is two walls with shelves in them of chrysalises that are the butterflies, the ancient butterflies of Barcelona that are going extinct, coming 
out of their cocoons. And every weekend the children will be able to open the outside windows to release the butterflies into Barcelona. And then the story becomes to talk to the parks department and the highway department. So all those things we used to call weeds, once again, are habitat. Another reason for the monarch decline is with, I think, 84% of the corn crop and over 90% of the soybean crop in the United States using Roundup Ready Monsanto crops. With the herbicides, we don't have milkweed in the soybean anymore. So if the idea is corn syrup and no butterflies, is that our intention? Because design is the first signal of human intention. And we're now the dominant species. So what is our intention? So the question becomes really real as a design question. Well, how do we design as a species? So let me talk about the book, The Upcycle, since it's why I'm here. I'd like to start with a nod to Stanford University Libraries and the archive, because this idea that we would record our legacies is actually quite important. Thomas Jefferson was my architect. For five years, I lived in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson on the lawn at the University of Virginia. When I got there to be the dean of the architecture school, I decided to get everything I could find written by him, even about him, and put it in a set of bookcases, like his bookcases at Monticello, in my upper, upstairs hall in a house he designed. And I would look at them for the next five years and see what I could learn. So the first thing I asked the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation, if they would help me with, is to find out when did Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence and what else was he doing at the time? He was 33 years old. He wrote it in 16 days. And if you look at his correspondence, he was the busiest person you can imagine. And yet, he sat and wrote the Declaration of Independence. He loved architecture. And if you think of him as a designer first, I think as he did, you can confirm that, not just by looking at Monticello, but by looking at his last design, which was his tombstone, his archive. The statement of his archive by him. And if you look on it, it says, Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which became the Bill of Rights, and father of the University of Virginia. That's it. Anything missing? Can you imagine being president of the United States twice? And it's not important enough to put on your tombstone. He's only recording his legacies, not his activities. No mention of his jobs. It's just what he leaves behind. So when Roberto called and said, we'd like you to be the first living archive at Stanford University, imagine. I kind of, I think I said, I'm not dead yet, <laughs> or something to that effect. It was, it's a beautiful thing, and, and what we're exploring, the idea that you would record your legacies, and everyone could, for their seventh generation. Let's not forget, we here in this room are Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation. What if we think like that? So, what are our stories? Because in the end, that's the question. What do we leave behind for the children? So our design value is how do we design in ways that love all the children of all species for all time? And what happens to your design when you do that? It's quite amazing. So here are some stories. From the upcycle, we have a section where we call no more zero. What is that? At the Earth Summit in 1992, the World Business Council, well, the Business Council for Sustainable Development, later to become the World Business Council, issued a proclamation that they would ask businesses to become eco-efficient, and they would produce less pollution, less impact, less waste, and that they would make more money. See, we accept the idea of pollution, and we just be less. Is that what we have?
And so we've ended up with so many companies, it's amazing. If you look at any corporate social responsibility or environmental report, they're all like this. They all start with charts like this. And they say, oh, carbon, we're going to reduce our carbon emissions by 20% by 2020. And our goal is zero. We're going to reduce our toxic emissions by blah, blah, blah. Over time, our goal is zero. We're going to reduce our water consumption. Our goal is zero. Our goal is zero. Can you imagine Mr. Jefferson putting that on his tombstone? My goal was zero. It would have been better if I wasn't here. Really? Are we supposed to tell our children, when I get up and go out for the day, Dad, what are you doing today? My goal is zero. You're not telling people what you're going to do. You're telling them what you'd rather not be. That's all. That would be like jumping in a taxi as I leave here and saying, quick, I'm not going to the airport. Huh? You're telling people what you don't want to be. From a commercial perspective, it's kind of nutty if you think about it. That's a bit of a quirky thing to say because I'm going to talk about peanut butter. Can you imagine walking in a grocery store and there's a jar of brown goop and it says, not peanut butter? Really? We're going to tell people what we're not? Or plutonium-free peanut butter. <laughs> so what do we want to do? Let's get positive. So we take the negative, because being less bad is not being good. It's amazing to me how many people think less bad is two negative numbers multiplied into a positive. Less is a relationship. Bad is a human value. You don't multiply them. By definition, you're bad, just less so. That's it. So we put that below the line and say, fine, if you're going to reduce the badness, go ahead. It's a great thing to do. It's demand side management. Of course you do that. Reduce your toxic loading. Reduce your carbon emissions. Sure. We see, we don't have an energy problem. We have a materials problem. We have carbon, a material, in the atmosphere problem. We have a material in the wrong place problem. A material in the wrong place is a toxin. Is lead a good or a bad? See, the context matters because lead in a child's mouth is a neurotoxin. Sounds bad. Lead in a smartphone is a solder that is going back to technology and never return to the biosphere, never sees the biosphere. Sure, it has to be looked at in terms of its mining and its potential dispositions, that's the point. But if it stays in the technosphere and never contaminates the biosphere, it's a technical nutrient. These are the tools of human production. And a tool's value is placed within it by the intentions of the user of the tool. So is a hammer a good or a bad? Depends. If I hit you in the face with it, whoops. The hammer doesn't know if it's a good or a bad. Poor little lead, so maligned. It didn't know. It's us and the way we use things. Carbon in the atmosphere is a material in the wrong place. How could we turn carbon, this amazing thing that we are made out of, that is a fundamental building block of life, and we turn it into a toxin? Oops. So if all we say is we're going to reduce our carbon, then we end up with ads like that of Toyota recently, which said, our aim, zero emissions, and they show a picture of a tree. Is this science? Zero emissions, a tree? Thank God trees emit oxygen. Birds, fruit, flowers, color. Emissions, beneficial emissions. As a designer of buildings, when I was a student at Dartmouth, I had been born in Tokyo, and I had come to Dartmouth, and I was an art student. And I had one curiosity from my early childhood, because I had, had the, the situation where I got to see Hiroshima when I was five years old. And I always had this curiosity. Why was Einstein afraid? 
And how and why would we blow each other up? How could this be that a city could disappear in seconds? And why would we do that to each other? So even though I was an art student, I decided to study nuclear physics, for which I was completely unprepared, of course. So I went to the professor and I said, I need to understand some, I think, nuclear physics. And he said, oh, you, can have no, you can't do this. And I said, well, I'm a student, I'm paying tuition, you're a teacher, you know, let's give it a shot. And, you know, you're probably right, but let's give it a try. He said, okay, special theory of relativity, here it is. Take it back to your dorm and work on this. So I kept staring at equals mc squared. I realized I couldn't do this, of course, you know. And I lit a fire, because at Dartmouth, you know, it's 1970, it's before the energy crisis, we're in New Hampshire, trees are weeds. Right, so I'm, I'm looking at the fire going, oh, there's entropy, we studied that. And I'm thinking, oh, is that all we have, chaos? Everything's dispersing, never to re-aggregate, that's all we got? I'm from Asia. What's the opposite of this? So I went to the library looking for negative entropy. I couldn't find it, came back, kept looking at it, I went, oh, it must be the log. I see, it's biology. Isn't that something? So when you stop and think about it from this design perspective, all of a sudden it occurred to me that from a designer's perspective, the idea that we would accrue energy from a nuclear reaction 93 million miles away, eight minutes and it's wireless, and we would take carbon out of the atmosphere, and we would accrue it into this beautiful thing called life itself. It's just such an amazing idea. I thought, if I'm ever an architect, I'm going to design buildings like trees. Because in the last 5,000 years, since we started banging metal, we realized it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. <laughs> We're sometimes not that bright. But what if we could design buildings like trees? Trees make oxygen, sequester carbon, fix nitrogen, distill water, provide habitat for hundreds of species, change colors with the seasons, accrue solar energy as food and fuel create microclimates and self-replicate. How are we doing? A lead platinum building reduces its carbon a bit. How are we doing? Building like a tree. Well, we finally got to do one. It's nearby. It's at NASA. It's their new space station. It's on Earth. They asked me if I would work on the Mars station. I said, why don't we come back to Earth first? You know, why are we going to the red planet when you haven't come back to the blue one? Tell us what you found out. So we took the International Space Station design team. We went to Houston in the room where they heard the words, Houston, we have a problem. And we said, okay, they say here on Earth you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something, but what if you were? Who did the energy here? Do you guys invent the photovoltaic? Uh-huh, all right, good, you're in charge of energy. How about water? $80,000 to get a gallon of water up on the International Space Station. I guess we must cycle everything, is that it? Yeah. Who did that? Oh, we did that. Is that forward osmosis? Mm hmm Good. You're in charge of water. So we brought them back to Earth as the Terranauts. And we imagined standing naked nearby here at Ames Mountain View. And said, what are we supposed to do now? And for a normal federal budget for an office building, we built a building that can generate 120% of the energy it needs to operate from renewable sources and purify its own water for normal budget and schedule. Leibniz said, if it is possible, therefore it exists. Our job as designers is to make it exist. Therefore, it is possible for other people to take this and move. That's the point of the upcycle. Things get better. And it's not about just being efficient. Peter Drucker said, it's a manager's job to be efficient, to do something the right way. But it's actually the executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. Then the managers can do it the right way. Because what if you're doing the wrong thing efficiently? What if you're a terrorist and you're efficient you're worse. See, efficiency is just a tool. It's metrics, it's statistical, it's benchmarking. And so what we do is we say, what are the tools of efficiency? Six Sigma. So total quality management, and I knew W. Edwards Deming before he died, 
He was a statistician, obviously a marvelous one, incredibly insightful. But I don't know if you know this, but the whole Toyota production system grew out of his experience watching women in American factories when the men were gone during the Second World War. And they outproduced the men. And they didn't have inspections. And the products were perfect. Because they wouldn't accept the idea of defects. And they outproduced the men. And so when the men came back, they said, you know, what happened? He said, you're not going to believe what you saw. They're not hierarchical, they're not inspection based, they sit in circles, they share work, <laughs> and they outperformed, and they didn't have exhortations. And, and the men said, That's nice. We're hierarchical, we're inspection based, we just won the war. Goodbye. And he went to Japan. But if you look at total quality management, it's actually, as practice, total quantity management, it's efficiency. Numeric, statistical, metric efficiency. And what we're talking about here is quality. What does it mean to be a good? That's a human value. So what we find is if you start with metrics, you can get to tactics and strategies and get to goals, like reduce your you know, carbon by 20% or something. Reduce, you know, avoid, minimize. You can be statistically interesting. But you can't get to your values from metrics. If you want to love all the children of all species, and then you have principles, under which you operate, then you set your goals. So when I did the River Rouge for Bill Ford, this auto plant, we could have spent $48 million, which they were ready to do on chemical treatment plants to clean the water. Instead, we used natural systems and bird habitats and did it for 13. So when I went to the board for approval, I had a minute and a half. And so I started by saying, I, I'll take my minute and a half. I understand. I can do the math. You're a $170 billion company, you have 11 meetings a year, this is one of them. This is a $150 million first phase approval, it's worth about a minute and a half. I got that. So in the first 30 seconds, and I have a few seconds left, let me say, this project is for the birds. And that is true. But you're fiduciaries in the car business, so let's talk about money in cars. You have posted on your books to spend $48, billion, $48 million to meet Clean Water Act requirements with three chemical treatment plants and four kilometers of concrete pipes. Piles of chemicals and 70 auto workers standing around praying it doesn't rain. That doesn't sound like value creation, buried assets. So this system is $13 million, so you're going to save $35 million day one in CapEx, capital expenditure, and with the Ford Taurus coming out of Chicago at a 4% margin, this is the equivalent of me walking into this room and offering you an order for $900 million worth of cars. Approved. It was for the birds. And look what happened. If I'd started with metrics, I would have said, maybe we can do two chemical treatment plants. Three miles, of, or three kilometers of pipes, you see? You, you can't jump. So these values are really important to drive our new design. So we, in products, we do the same thing. So we've designed products like textiles that are so safe, you can eat them. Does it matter? I don't know. We went to a company in 1993 in Switzerland. Their trimmings of their cloth had been declared hazardous waste by the Swiss government. They couldn't bury or burn it in Switzerland. They had to ship it to Spain. So we looked at 8,000 chemicals in the textile industry and eliminating carcinogens, mutagens, endocrine disruptors. We had to get rid of 7,962. We were left with 38 chemicals, and we did all the fabrics with 38 chemicals. So beautiful. And the trimmings became mulch for the local garden club. And the water leaving the factory was as clean as Swiss drinking water. And the cost of the fabric was reduced by 20%, because we didn't have any regulations. There was nothing, nothing to be afraid of. Imagine that. And is it good for business? I don't know. It was selected for the Airbus 380 as the fabric of choice. So safe, in a place where you worry about air quality and comfort, good, good ventilation. And as a side benefit, if you don't like the food and you're suffering from an extreme fiber deficiency, you can safely eat your chair. In this book, I also look at a notion called wind equals food. That came about because we were designing in the Baltic Sea. And I was thinking, you know, in the dark, in the winter, how do we use renewable energy? Where's the sunshine? So what do they have for solar income? Well, 
have wind. And it's about, usually at 2 o'clock at night. Hmm. So, thought about it. And now with LEDs, we've found, working with the Dutch, that the strawberry, for example, only needs two pieces of the red frequencies and five, uh, three blues. We can draw strawberries in the dark with very low energy input. Just the frequency the strawberry wants. It doesn't care about the rest of the spectrum. Amazing. And so we started imagining what it would be like to use wind to grow food. And it's astonishing what happens when you think it through. And as we worked on that, then we looked, I was looking at China for some government officials there, and we were looking at the west of Beijing and the, the lowest plains where the wind is, and they, we don't know how to get the wind to Beijing as energy because of this time of day thing, we don't have load leveling, and it's quite, we're doing a lot of big wind things there for our clients. But, you know, these large assets out there, and we want to reduce the dust, and, and we want to do things. We don't want to have agriculture that uses all the water because it's huge. These huge hydraulic projects there are terrifying. I mean, they're monstrous. And so we started thinking, how can we grow things with, you know, 2% of the water, maybe 0.2% of the water? And what if we could use the wind power? And all of a sudden it occurred to me that we haven't really used biology as a battery yet. What if we use the wind turbines to grow food at night, etc.? And what if we took the coal trains and used them to bring the foods to the city? And when we get to the city, what if we take all the cuttings and everything else from the food and human sewage? And wait a minute, sewage? Sewage? Treatment? Really? Born in Japan, I was three years old, I would lie on my futon staring at the wood joinery and the ceiling, I guess, to become an architect someday. And I remember at two in the morning, my mother would start singing songs because the farmers would come in with their honey wagons, with the oxen, to collect our sewage, to take to the farms for composting and fertilizer. And we always thought the city and the farm was one, were one organism. And you're three years old, and it's poop stories, nothing better. So, you know, I just remember that. So we started thinking, well, what if the cities could return the nutrients to these growing systems? And all of a sudden we started studying what it meant to have phosphate recovery and we found companies because I work with VCs here and so on. And we found a guy in Vancouver who had sewage treatment operator who had put a vortex on the back on the front end of a sewage sludge pipe so it wouldn't mineralize and reduce its diameter. And the stuff came out as little pearls of struvite phosphate wrapped around magnesium and nitrogen. And it's slow release fertilizer and all of a sudden we're seeing the model where sewage treatment plants become fertilizer factories, and we send the minerals back to the farmers. 12% economic return. Same with nitrogen. And the methane can be captured and used for polymerization, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, the cities have fertilizer factories making money instead of sewage treatment plants that cost money. And we need to add chlorine. Think about all this. And then you think, now the farmers have slow-release fertilizer, so we don't have non-point source pollution. Oh, the oysters come back crabs, you see, all that. So it's a regenerative act, this. So instead of just reduce, reuse, if we're us reusing toxic things, soft PVC, you must be kidding. Recycle. Recycle things that aren't designed for, to be recycled, really. So to that we'd like to add redesign, renew, regenerate. Last night, I was at a party for the book, and I looked out at the group of people, and at the end of the day, I said, you know, you're just all a bunch of regenerates. It's time to be fierce and a bit spunky. Physicists tell us that one of the most powerful forces we know now is the vacuum, the emptiness. The Taoists knew that. They talk about the value of a vessel is its emptiness. It's our curiosity about how to move into an uncertain place. These all, all come together. So why wouldn't we have cities that are connected to the farms? Why wouldn't our nutrition be both biological and technical? So it's really, again, when I look at the Netherlands where I'm working, 
I don't know how many of you realize this. Do you know what the second largest actor in agriculture is from an economic perspective, agricultural exporter in the world? After the US? It's a country the size of Maryland. It's the Netherlands. Isn't that something? More than Brazil, more than Canada. It's quite astonishing. And they have an intensive agriculture and they use greenhouses. So maybe the greenhouse effect is something to really think about, except it's a positive thing this time. And our agriculture becomes intense and our cities become fertilizer factories. And we take the gray water buildings and return it to agriculture and we take our nutrients and return them to our agriculture and we upcycle, upcycle, positive acts. So in pondering all this, I started to think during the election cycle when the candidates started saying we need energy independence in America. And I know an amazing study has been done here at Stanford on what it would mean to renewable power, you know, as a dream and imagining it parsed out as an engineering exercise. But I started to think about this statement they were making, let's use public lands to get energy independence. Well, that's an interesting idea. Oh, let's go drill in Montana. Mm. Let's build a pipeline from Alberta to Texas. Eminent domain? We're arguing about carrying guns and we're talking about taking land from people? Really? Is that the idea? When was the last time we had a big eminent domain move in this country? Eisenhower, 50s, federal highway system. Oh, it was a national security issue then too. Interesting. After the Second World War, we were worried about nuclear bombs, the Cold War. We had to have highways to get our people out of the cities in a hurry. We had to move our military around and it was good for, for trade. Fine. So guess what? We have an immense public domain. Let's use public lands to get energy independence. Amtrak has 14,000 miles of right of way in the sunshine. What if all our communities now that solar collectors are 80 cents a watt, they're a commodity. Why don't we all get to work? Why don't we have jobs every community? Solar power in the United States. Why not? We can do this. All of a sudden our economies are recovering. We have recurrency because the income, the only form of income we have on this planet is really solar energy. We don't have material income. Right? It's not raining phosphate. We're going to have to buy it from Morocco. Is that what we want? But this idea we would have recurrency and then we can recapitalize instead of spending things as currency every year and losing our capital. So all of a sudden, this idea of upcycling, things get better. We even upcycled our certification system for Cradle to Cradle products. We put it in the public domain. We created the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute with support from the Dutch and from the Schmidt family here. Um, and it's here in San Francisco. And now we're cr doing Cradle to Cradle certification in the public domain. And lead the system of building assessments and certification of the U.S. Green Building Council is looking to adopt Cradle to Cradle for lead points. So that instead of just saying we have recycled content in a product that may never have been designed to be recycled or could produce dioxins in a fire or has plasticizers and you get points for that, you actually get points for good intention and constant improvement because cradle to cradle is a humility of constant improvement. It says let's do assessment and then do inventory, then we assess and for products what we're saying is what if we design products that don't have any chemicals that accrue in human mother's milk? How's that for a filter? I call it the baleen. Because what we realize, we now see 2,500 synthetic chemicals in human mother's milk. Is that the plan? We don't need to do this. We have the science to help us. So I think, let me conclude with the statement and the question, all in one. What's next? I was at a conference on the future of textiles. There were 150 textile manufacturers there presenting to the world's largest apparel company. And I went to every single person since I was closing the conference. And I said, so what's next? And they said, you know, next year I'm coming back with LED clothing that expresses emotions. 
or I have skin, you know, I have stem cell clothing that grows on your skin. I mean, it was one thing after another, and I was like, no, no, I'm not asking you what you're bringing back next year. I'm asking what's next for the thing you just showed us this year. Not one person knew what would happen to the amazing things they showed us. Next. They had never designed what's next into what's now. And I think this idea of endless resourcefulness is really important. And it's the endless resourcefulness of materials and safe cycles and metabolism, the endless resourcefulness of clean energy, but especially the endless resourcefulness of our children as they take these challenges on in the future. And we need to give them a fulcrum on which to lean the levers of change so they don't just think, oh, our parents, they really didn't want to be here. Their goal was zero. So, what's next is what's next. So it's our choice. You could be degenerates or regenerates. Thank you very much. Happy to. We've been uh, starting something in Palo Alto that came from the Netherlands called, and I was wondering if you could offer some coaching tips, called Repair Cafe. And, oh, sure. Um, and we've, we've done it three times, and we've had 300 people. We've just had all sorts of people showing up. And, and I, I was thinking a lot about your, your vision and how, to a certain degree, it manifests itself in sort of touch points, you know, sort of small uh, opportunities. And so I was wondering if, if you were knowing what a repair cafe is and you were trying to do something with it to bring this upcycle across, are there any points or thoughts you would have on how when we have all these people congregating looking at products and trying to confront them what you would, what you would say or what you might do? Well, first of all, I would celebrate it as a, um, as a social act of, of really marvelous um, character. For those of you who haven't seen this, Repair Cafe is a place to bring the broken vacuum cleaner or the toaster or whatever. And there's people, there are people who come and bring their tools and they help you fix it and things like that. The Repair Cafe. Isn't that beautiful? See, these would be the products you love. So you love your vacuum cleaner, and you think it would be great if you could have it uh, last a little bit longer, a lot longer, and that's a marvelous thing. And we're also seeing a parallel with this, which is share cafes, which are being on the internet. Right? We're seeing things like Yertle coming along, where you can say, I just moved a house, and I brought three hoses, and there are three hoses here, and I have six hoses, I don't need them. Anybody need three hoses? You know, fair enough. And so it's, it's not de-shopping, it's sort of just another way of getting utility and objects in the, in the world without the conspicuous consumption of brand new things all the time, which we don't necessarily need. So the Repair Cafe to me is just a marvelous chance for people who love, I'm one of them, you know, to repair stuff. I mean, I like it. I have tools. I mean, I bet most, you know, people have tools around and like using them. I know I do. So. That part of it, I think, is magnificent. The question becomes, you know, what happens with this issue of planned obsolescence? And there are a lot of things that aren't designed to be repaired, for example. There are a lot of things that we design now that could be designed for disassembly, and then we can separate them. I know the recent complaints about the new Macintosh, and the new Mac uh, book, that it's glued together because it saves space and it's, Etc. And so people are saying, well, it's nice to say it's all recyclable, but um, it's all glued together. It can't come apart. Well, actually, we did a project in, with Philips where we said, what if we have a new glue that shrinks at certain temperatures? So you can actually just put these things in an oven, 
falls apart on purpose. Now, would you repair that? No, because it's not designed for your screwdriver, etc. I mean, it's not like that. But there are things that we can love repairing. So I think there's room for all of these agendas. And the one I love about Repair Cafe, it's a cafe. <laughs> think about that. It's fantastic. When you look at Starbucks, how did it start? Howard Schultz was in Milan at a beautiful cafe and said, oh, the third place. In America, we have the first place, home, second place, work, and that's it. We don't have a place to be private and public in America. Can you imagine? I mean, you can complain all you want about the fact you can see three Starbucks from every corner in San Francisco. The fact of the matter is, before Starbucks, you couldn't find a good cup of coffee, no matter where you went, it seemed, okay? unless you were in Vienna. So, it's amazing. The whole idea of cafe culture is so astonishing. A place to fall in love, you know, a place to read a newspaper, a place to be in society. So I think the idea that objects of ordinary life become an opportunity to share with another human, how cool is that? Right? So I think that's probably its main value in a funny way, is that we're engaging with each other and with our things, and then we can respect each other more and more, and the things more and more. So, Repair Cafe. But if you're repairing things that are toxic, or you're using a toxic glue to repair it and get sick in the process, you see that? It is interesting. When Tom Lovejoy told me a story that during the Earth Summit, they were trying to convince George Bush the first to vote for the Bi Biodiversity Convention, and so they had to encounter John Sununu, an engineer who was chief of staff, and explain the Biodiversity Convention. So Dr. Lovejoy brought in Yale Wilson from Harvard to explain biodiversity to the engineer. And at the end of this, Sununu said to, to uh, Wilson, so you want the president to sign something that's like an endangered species act for the whole world, is that it? And the devil's in the details. And Dr. Wilson stood up and said, no sir, God is in the details and left. Details matter. So what are we repairing? It's important. So what about all the things we were talking to that have already been made and disposed of? Like to what, ex to what extent are the things that are already toxic and poison and waste and buried in the earth just like are a fate complete like okay we'll start from here and make all things well do we ignore those things like what happens to those great question i think for certain things like pvcs certain especially the soft pvcs we're going to have to wait so we should put those aside in some kind of parking lot until we get some way to deal with them without the toxifications, they just are tough. But when you look at the plastics four through seven, for example, the films and the, you know, the undefined stuff typically today, we're looking at that as a resource for various materials that we can use in the future. So these we can mine, certainly the metals and so on. So really it's a few parts of it that we can't reuse, you know, things like PVC. So we can do that and I think we will do that. Um, on the other hand, why do we need seven kinds of plastic? And so we're also working on that. And so right now I'm doing a project with one of the major companies on redesigning packaging, because right now the pouches are seven layers of different kinds of polymer. Some are for shininess, some are for ink, some are for oxygen, some are for water, you know, et cetera. Seven laminate layers to just make this granola thing. You know, Really, it's amazing, monstrous hybrid. So you can't get that apart, you can't recycle. It's just, it's not designed for any next so we're redoing that right now. Very excited about how that'll work. So that can get coherent. And one of the ways we're doing that is we're working with the companies that now call themselves waste um, handlers of whatever description. And we're saying, we need you to be in the design chain sending economic messages upstream, saying, look, if you sent us things that were coherent polyesters arranged like this, doing all those things, but they're one polymer, so we can truly recycle them in a beneficial way, and maybe even upcycle them and take out the antimony residues from catalytic reactions, which is a heavy metal, which is silly, because we don't need antimony to catalyze these, we can do them with titanium. So we can actually upcycle the polyesters. We get them back, we remove the toxins, we do it with new catalysts that are clean, and we call this 
this, and we put molecular markers on it so we know that this is designed for future generations like that, and we can sort for it as it comes through the system. Because we can now sort these polymers using infrared, UV, molecular markers, we've got all sorts of ways to deal with this stuff. Quite awesome. So there's that. On the flip side, we have to look at things like sachets and in developing countries where we're seeing the market for, for shampoos, soaps, and so on, getting these little like ketchup packet type things, and they're everywhere, and it's a nightmare. And they used to call it serving the bottom of the pyramid or something, you know? And the problem is it's just, you know, it's, it's garbage, and it's clogging drain, it's horrible. So we're now looking at that and saying, what if we make it with coconut fiber and we actually use it to do bad gardening? And so the people, the kids are collecting them and they can put them in. You know, maybe the, the things that we ship this stuff in is actually becomes a bag garden for the people and the box that came in or the bag. And then the sachets are actually, you know, we have like a gardener's dozen. So every 13th one, if you're a gardener, you get a little pack of fertilizer. What fun. And then you take these things and use them for soil amendments. Because the biggest problem with the bag gardens and the, and the favelas and so on is that they use soil, which is very compact and it doesn't absorb water well and retain it. So these could be your soil lighteners as your package, you see. And you have this beautiful thing happening where you layer these things and now you're growing your food. So all of a sudden, everything is food. The packaging is food for something. See, like that. So if the people handling what's now called waste see themselves as nutrient managers and send a signal all the way to their raw material suppliers saying, if you produce value for me here, I'll share it back upstream with you. See, and all of a sudden everybody's getting wealthier. And then they start to move because the money keeps it moving. But it, right now, they don't know what's next and they don't really worry about it. How can you have planned obsolescence if you don't know what's next? It's just obsolescence. Yes. Sphere that you mentioned that shouldn't like things that we design their technology shouldn't affect the biosphere, but when I look at how, you know, microchips are made now and computers are made, I don't understand, I'm not seeing how, how, we, can, how we can actually realize that, where the technology that we develop doesn't affect the biosphere. You mentioned something about that in your, in your talk. Well, I think there are various aspects of that. There's a physical aspect, there's an economic aspect, and there's a logistical aspect. And so, and I think that in the first instance, it's, probably not fair to expect everybody to have to be able to understand this and deal with it every day, right? They're just there to, you know, we're there to support their lives and their creativity. So first thing we do is we look at people and decide with the product, am I serving a consumer or a customer? See, I can't consume electronics, right? So how, why would I call myself a consumer of a computer? I don't eat it, I don't consume it, right? So it's really a service. So we see that as a product of service. So these things could actually be done in a way that you get the service you want, and it's like a subscription or a lease kind of arrangement. You could do it as a technical purchasing, but the company can say we want it back. It's almost like having an option on the nutrients. So if you take something as simple as a carpet, we now, I've designed carpets that are infinitely reusable and they're safe. And the marvelous thing is the business relationship is with your customer. You're actually storing your future safe materials on their floors. Okay? Because when they want a new carpet, the cheapest carpet they can get is the one that you bring them, taking back the one on their floor designed for you to reuse. And it's not some poison you're reusing. It's actually designed as your raw material. And we have 1.4 billion pounds of carpet waste in America every year. So wouldn't it be marvelous if that was all designed as a system? See, now just take something as simple as a carpet and just start to think computer or smartphone. And what if you just take these things and turn them in and have a relationship with the companies that make them and maybe these things are designed for disassembly and they go back into the systems and we extract all the materials and we go back into manufacturing. And what's interesting as I work with the Chinese is we're now deploying very large funds that we're putting together, very large funds. And in fact, the largest investment funds in the world, it looks like they will be to get these right technologies because 
they need them for their social security. Their, their social security fund is at 1.3 trillion and they have 1.3 billion people, so that's a thousand a person. Okay, I mean, ours don't look too great either, but, um, but that's only a thousand a person. So they wanna make investments in the health and safety of their materials and systems because then they're doing the social security of their people as they make money. So just making money while they toxify is antithetical to the purpose of the fund, you see? So they've got to give the fund this other set of values. Now when you put that on electronics, very interesting things happen because logistics become part of the big issue in the future. So what we're seeing is that we can take some of these advanced technologies and you talk about the microchip fabs, for example. These fabs can be products of service themselves. And so we can actually look at the creation of factories in China at a very low cost to serve their markets, which are designed as systems that know how to deal with this stuff and take things apart and put things back together. And they can send us factories, not just the products, because in the end, all sustainability, like politics, is local. And the Chinese are gonna need to make sure we have a thriving American economy and jobs, otherwise they killed the customer. Right? The first job of business supports your customers, or to use one of our normal double negatives, don't kill the customers, right? Job one, don't kill the customers. So we start designing fabs that can put things together where the materials are. See, and the reason we have carpet still is because it's heavy and it's cheap. So logistics are too expensive. That's why we still have the last remaining textile industry in this country. But just take that and start to play it out. Very interesting things start to happen. So if you design into it, you know, it's just, it's not what we do now. It's different. But I'll tell you, when we work on the TV, the television, we took, we could use better materials because when we're gonna take them apart and we get them back, all of a sudden they become coherent. We don't have 20 kinds of polymer, you know. We're using Lego polymer because other people want that, you know. We're using metals instead of polymers in certain uses because they're more utile and easier to disassemble, things like that. So you're actually designing into it that way. Um, thanks. Um, it just seems to me that uh, this gives me some hope because it seems like you're starting at the top with the dollars and the cents and how money is made doing these things as opposed to the bottom growing something organically, which is so difficult. I think I turned this thing off. I don't, it's okay. <laughs> you can just speak so, out. I think it's gonna to have to be everybody, all the time, every dimension, every scale, fierceness, wage peace, go forth. It's gonna take us all. It's gonna take forever. That's the point. I mean, a regulation is a signal of design failure. So a regulator plays a very critical role. They send the message that society is scared. Or you're doing something really dangerous. Fine, that's why we have regulations. Business hates regulation because it costs money. So we have a simple response. Don't make things that scare people, right? Save money. Everybody's happy, move forward, get on with it, right? And what I've also found is that business leaders, they, they don't wake up in the morning saying, I wonder how many people I killed today. They're not like that. They are, I mean, people are well-meaning. They just need a little encouragement. But people, I think, want to do the right thing. And I think the market should get up and say, we prefer the right things. That's why we put the certification in the public domain. Because now you'll be able to say, we prefer a cradle to cradle certified product. It's at the beginning, but hey, the word goes out. People go, what is that? You can go to the web, there it is. Get on with it, right? And if we get enough people saying that, it, it all builds up. And remember what Gorbachev and Jefferson both said independently, obviously. I don't think they were colluding, um, but and Gorbachev, I remember, told me this, and I read it in Jefferson. They both said the same thing. It was essentially this. The revolution was caused when 5% of 
of the thinking population aligned around the idea. Perestroika and the American Revolution, both referenced by the authors of key documents as when 5% of the thinking population got it, it started to move. Now, if we think about it, you know, with Vermont, right, with 300,000 people, 5%, not a huge number. China, 5% of 1.3 billion. But we're starting to see now, people will not move to Beijing. They won't take their families there. That's, that, I'm sure that scares Tiananmen Square. People, when 5% of the thinking population says, we, we want a different way, things start to move, right? So, I, I hate to cut going. off a fascinating conversation. Uh, but I know you do have a schedule to keep, and I want to make sure we have an opportunity to have you sign a few books. And Great. Get, uh, get over there. So I want to thank Bill for coming to the library today. Uh, Privilege. Fascinating. And I encourage and uh, buy a copy of the new book. It'll be right over here. Thank you.